Welcome to Focus On. I'm your host, Katherine Thompson, and today we're visiting the Thomas Edison Depot Museum in Port Huron, Michigan. I'm sure most of you know that Thomas Edison grew up in Port Huron and that he invented the first electric light bulb. However, did you know that he was called Al when he lived here and that he also invented the phonograph, the microphone, the carbon telephone transmitter, the typewriter, and the first motion picture camera? Let's go inside and see what else we can learn. Joe Burgett is a site manager at the depot. Joe, thanks for having us. We're really excited. What can you tell us about the train we just saw? The train actually is a representation of the train that Thomas Edison rode on when he was a young boy here. He came to work in 1859 here at this depot as the news butcher, and it's an exact replica, or as close as we could get to it, in miniature of the train that he actually rode on. I like the concept of it going around the ceiling. Now one of the things that we do is he starts out here in Fort Gratiot, which is this depot right above our heads. And as you travel through the depot, you will see other small miniature depots of the different places that he stopped on his trip during the day. The Smith Creek Depot is right over our head over here. And then you can follow his travels all the way over to the Michigan um, Central Depot on the other side of the building. Now how is the concept for this depot formed? The history of it? The history of the depot specifically. We have a lot of people in this area that are huge Grand Trunk Railroad fans and uh, we wanted to preserve it for them but we also wanted to preserve the history of Thomas Edison and his um, childhood here in Port Huron. And, his, and he had a huge part in, this, in the history of this building because he worked here from a 12-year-old tw boy until age 16. Now, I I noticed this is a very unusual TV set here. It's a TV set in a suitcase. Well, actually, the reason why we have it here is to display this movie. It's Young Tom Edison starring Mickey Rooney. The significance for that movie for us is, as many of our family members will recall, my mom is one of them, as a matter of fact. Mickey Rooney made the trip to Port Huron in 1940 when the movie was premiered here at the Desmond Theater on the other side of town. So we run this movie continuously throughout the day. And folks, of course, never sit here. It's an hour and 45 minutes long, but they have an opportunity to view what the, mo the view the movie while they're here. And then when we travel around to the other side of the depot, we have actual newsreel footage of the event, which was a huge, huge party here in Port Huron. Mina Edison, who is Edison's widow, was here to be a part of that celebration, as well as Louis B. Mayer and other um, big dignitaries from Hollywood. Now I notice um, who came up with the idea of how this screen was placed because it looks like there's a, a tiny steamer trunk and then there's a suitcase behind it. How did you come up with that well, idea? I didn't think of it all by myself. It was actually done by design craftsmen from Midland who um, are responsible for the re construction, the refurbishing of the museum and they're also doing the rail car that we'll be bringing in in another f four to six weeks. Well, this was a great idea. Now, Joe, let's see what else we have here. Now, Joe, this looks like the path that Thomas Edison took to Port Huron. Is that right? Absolutely. These are his parents, Sam and Nancy Edison. They um, moved to Port Huron in 1854 from Milan, Ohio, when Edison was seven years old. We endearingly refer to him as Al when we're in this part of the building because that was his nickname while he lived here. Al is, of course, short for Alva, as you know. The family originally lived in Nova Scotia, and then they moved to Port Huron after um, their, their um, sojourn to Milan, Ohio. It's believed that Sam traveled through Port Huron to Milan originally and then moved his family there. Later, as the economy began to wane in Milan, he remembered that Port Huron had a huge lumbering business here, and we also were a huge shipbuilding town at that time. So he brought his family back here with the hope of being able to make a, a more than adequate living for his wife and his children. That is lucky for us. Now there's a house here. Is this their first home? That's the home that Edison was born in, and it is also a museum in Milan, Ohio. So anybody traveling towards Sandusky, Ohio, or traveling that way, it's open to the public as we are here. What's the next step on our tour, Joe? 
Well, this vignette is, a represent, is representative of his education that he received in Port Huron, which was very brief, as you probably know. He only attended school in Port Huron formally for three months. His mother, Nancy, was a school teacher, actually, in Vienna, Ontario, when she met Sam. And so she was very well qualified to teach him herself. But what happened was that um, Mr. Crawford, who was his teacher, had made the decision to kick him out of school. He had decided that he was adult or crazy and unteachable and so he was going to actually have him removed from public school so Nancy who as you can see is quite upset in this exhibit took him to school promptly and told Mr. Crawford that that was fine maybe the problem was that that Al might be a little bit smarter than he was and so she decided that she would teach him at home she in fact is quoted as saying that maybe he could learn more at his mother's knee than he could from Mr. Crawford Joe, what is this exhibit? This is actually the basement of the home, a replica of the laboratory, not the first laboratory, of course, that he ever had. This is his second laboratory. His first was in his bedroom. He made such a terrible mess and frightened his mother so much with his <laughs> chemicals that she made him move it to the cellar so for fear of burning down the house. So that's what this represents. The home actually was very unusual in that it had a wooden basement. It was one of only six in Michigan at the time that had a wooden basement. Oh, and that was one of the reasons why it remained so well preserved and it was it was so easy to do the archaeological dig at that site because the basement had remained intact. Now I noticed uh, there are all kinds of things here. Were all these taken from the home site? Yes, as a matter of fact, they were. Most of what they discovered was found in the outhouse of the home because in that era, that's where they threw their trash. So much of what was discovered was discovered there in that spot. But we had uh, over 128,000 artifacts were recovered there. Um, the, it, the archaeological dig was done from 1976 until 1994, periodically throughout the summer. It was actually led by Dr. Richard Stamps and in in his team from Oakland University. Now, obviously, we don't have all of the artifacts here. What happened to the rest of them? Many of them are at Oakland University, and then the museum also holds some in the archives. Is it true that Edison became a businessman at a very young age? Oh, absolutely. When he was 12 years old when he went to work here at the depot as the news butcher. When he began his route every day, he would originally he sold only the Detroit Free Press and popcorn and peanuts. He expanded that to sell fruits and vegetables, corn cob pipes, things that you see in this basket that he thought people that were traveling along the route would enjoy or needed. One of the things that's very interesting about him as a savvy businessman is that the first year that he worked out of the depot he made six hundred dollars. In today's money that's equivalent to thirty six thousand dollars. That's amazing and how old was he? He was actually 12 years old when he started working out of here. So that was between the ages of 12 and 13. When he was 16 years old, he owned two stores here in Port Huron. One was um, a store that he sold periodicals out of, and the other he sold fruits and vegetables. He actually gave his mother a dollar a day every day to help with living expenses. So he was always loyal to the family in that way. But the rest of his money he loved to use for um, chemicals and bottles and things that he could do his experiments with. Now, I believe I read that this newspaper that he published was the first newspaper that was ever published or printed on a rail road car. That's Is that true? true? That's true. It was the um, first, and, it, and as far as we know today, the only newspaper that was ever printed on a moving train. And what was the name? The name was The Herald the Weekly Herald, as a matter of fact. He was pretty savvy in the way that he marketed it also. He sold it for seven cents a subscription. Um, per. It was a weekly paper that he published, and it was seven cents a month for a subscription. The day the Battle of Shiloh broke out, however, he really expanded that. When he left Port Huron, he was selling it for seven cents a copy, and because the telegraphers along the way were sending him information about the battle, he was constantly updating the newspaper, and by the time he re arrived in Detroit, he was selling it for 30 cents a copy. Amazing. Now I know that you have copies of the newspaper here and do you give those 
to people who visit the museum? Yes, we do. There's only two copies left in existence. This one and an, that you see here and another copy. And so we do provide those for visitors. And we also make sure that teachers who come and bring their classrooms and have copies for those students as well. One of the things that we think is particularly interesting about Edison is that as a 12-year-old boy, he would leave this depot seven days a week um, at 7 a.m. in the morning and return here at 9 o'clock at night. And he really wanted to do the work himself. Once in a while he would contract another youngster to take the route over for a, an afternoon, but he really liked to do it because he wanted the money himself. This next exhibit is a recreation of Thomas Edison's Black Mariah, the world's first motion picture studio. Why was it called the Black Mariah, Joe? Well, it reminded folks of the p paddy wagons or the police wagons and, that were ha used to take people to jail. So they called it the Black Mariah after those wagons. And this was actually the first motion picture studio? Well, this isn't actually the first one. It is actually a replica of the first one. But it can be seen, the original one can be seen at Menlo Park. Um, it was used to film mo uh, motion pictures, not unlike the ones we do today. It's not quite as large as the studios in Hollywood, but it is um, the very first one that was ever done in the world. Now the setup is really interesting to me. Can you explain what happened when they were taping or filming? Well, they used black tar paper on the outside of the building to deflect the sun. And the top of the building actually had an opening in the roof so that the sunlight could be used to expose the film. And the the building itself sat on a circular piece of um, wood and one of the things that was very interesting is as the sun would move across the sky, the building was moved in conjunction with the sunlight in order to make the filming possible. Oh, that's amazing. And what was the cost of this first motion picture studio? It was $638. One of the things that in, strikes me about it the most is when it's very warm outside here, I can almost smell this tar paper cooking in the sunlight. I can't imagine what it would be like <laughs> to, be, to be one of the, you know, Sandra Bullock working on a film in a, in a room this size covered with black tar paper today. I think our stars in our um, century enjoy many more uh, fruits of their labor than the, st the stars did in that era. And a lot more money, too. <laughs> Let's take a look at the inside of the first motion picture studio. What goes on in here, Joe? Well, normally during the regular business hours, we have this movie running. It's very educational and entertaining, and it includes actual footage of Edison with his friends Henry Ford, Harvey Firestone, and John Burroughs. Then in addition to that, this room is used for special activities, not unlike school tours and uh, any other special events that we might have here. And at this point, I'd like to introduce Bill Emery affectionately known as Captain Science. And Bill is a retired school teacher who is the educational liaison for the depot. Bill, how did you become involved? My contribution really stems from my educational background. And when I was asked to get involved, I wanted to set a goal. And the goal was to provide a worthwhile, interesting, and fun experience. I think we've achieved that by having different, different de demonstrations for the children. How many demonstrations do you have or do you offer here? Currently we have three and they all stem uh, and deal with electricity. <clears throat> One has to do with static electricity using the Van de Graaff machine. And the uh, second one has to do with current electricity. And the third one has to do with electromagnets. Now how do children and teachers sign up to see these demonstrations? We would like them to call uh, the depot, uh, tell us exactly what they want uh, to achieve on their tour because there's different components to the tour besides just touring, the gift shop, the video, the demonstration, and then of course we're going to have the baggage car soon. Uh, we can design whatever will fit their needs in the classroom. Now, are these demonstrations specifically for teachers and students, or do you offer the demonstrations to the public? On special occasions, we've offered for the public, but primarily they were designed for school-age kids. Now, I think that 
the demonstrations reflect part of the state mandated curriculum for the elementary grades, fourth grade I believe. Exactly what age level are the demonstrations set for? Once we start looking at uh, the curriculum here, and of course having taught for many years in fifth grade, uh, and looking through the textbooks of, uh, that are used in Port Huron, we really decided that third through sixth grade was really the best overall grade level for what we wanted to, to demonstrate and, and achieve and, as our goal. And to get the maximum benefit from the demonstrations, do the kids have to have some type of pre-knowledge or some experience? It's very uh, helpful that the classrooms do some pre-work, either through reading of literature, uh, using the internet, knowing something of Thomas Edison. So when they get here, uh, Things won't really be new to them, but it will enhance and broaden their experience. Well, I've heard great things about these demonstrations and about the work that you do. The kids have been so excited about it. The teachers have wonderful things to say about it. And also, I thought or heard that part of the curriculum, the core curriculum for the elementary school is to study or learn something about um, hometown heroes or famous people in their hometown. Is that true? Um, fourth grade primarily deals with Michigan history, so this certainly fits in. But as I keep saying to people, I mean, we have history at our doorstep here. It's a shame that we don't explore it, use it, and take true advantage of it. And the people at, this, uh, at the depot have done a fabulous job, excellent job. I definitely agree with you. What's our next step, Joe? Well, let's go outside and take a look at some of the, not outside the building, but let's go on to the other side of the building and take a look at some of his achievements as an adult and how they fit into his life here in Port Huron. Thank you, Captain Science. My pleasure. Now, this exhibit seems to show that Thomas Edison didn't permanently leave Port Huron, that he returned. Is that true, Joe? That's absolutely correct. He always maintained ties throughout his life with Port Huron. His mother and father, Sam and Nancy, are buried here in Port Huron at Lakeside Cemetery, and along with his brother, William Pitt Edison, and his spouse and their children, and his sister, Harriet, who was also known as Tanny, and her husband. They're buried uh, at, in a prominent spot at Lakeside Cemetery, so we like to m remind people of that when they visit the depot. In 1914, he had a wonderful event here, held here in his honor by his good friend Henry Ford. They had a huge party at the Harrington Inn, which is, was then known as the Harrington Hotel. And it was just a, a party to just say, I'm glad to be back in Port Huron and I appreciate where I'm from. Another interesting fact that is a little known fact, I think, by most residents of Port Huron was his close personal relationship with Edward Acheson. Acheson was actually one of the pioneer boys who worked on the carbon filament um, for the light bulb in New Jersey. And he was looking for a, a place that would provide him with an unsurmountable amount of fresh water for his manufacturing process. Edison informed him of the, pl uh, of course, this place, which is the largest body of fresh water in the world. And so Atchison brought his manufacturing firm to Port Huron, and now we have a wonderful connection with the Atchison um, family. Edison is most famous for inventing the electric light bulb, but you told me that his favorite invention was the phonograph. Absolutely. In fact, this machine is here for the purpose of demonstrating to students and visitors, not just students alone, um, Edison's actual love for reproducing sound. And he actually, when he did the phonograph, never thought that it would develop into the industry that it has become today. 
I found this really interesting, Joe. Will you explain what happens in this exhibit? Well, with this particular exhibit, this part of it, it's almost a two-fold exhibit. One side of it, when you um, crank it, will, um, it has a soundtrack of the reproduction of Edison's voice and the explanation from, in his own words, in his own voice of uh, the original recording in the very first phonograph machine. And then when you push the button on the other side, you hear a wonderful reproduction of Sophie Tucker singing. She was one of the very world's very first recording artists. Oh, that is just amazing. Now there is a huge black thing up here that looks like a witch's hat. What is that? Actually, it's, a, it's one of Edison's um, hearing pieces that he used. It's from Menlo Park, New Jersey, and the piece was held in place next to his ear, the narrow part, of course, next to his ear, and then when they would want direction or instruction from Edison, someone would stand at the very end of it and shout in so that he could um, then respond in some kind and give them the, the direction that they uh, needed. In fact, by the end of his life, he was so profoundly deaf that he could hardly um, uh, hear very much at all. Joe, this is bigger than a five-year-old. I can't believe it. Could he really hear with this? Well, he, I believe that he could. Of course, his favorite, one of his favorite quotes was, people will continue to hear what they want to hear when they want to hear it. And he often used his deafness as sort of a way to protect him from the outer world. He often said that it gave him the powers of concentration that he needed to really achieve things and get them done. I think a lot of husbands have used that, too. <laughs> All right, what do we have over here? I must tell you at this point, this has been so interesting. There are so many things here that we haven't even touched on. And I hope everyone gets a chance to stop by the museum and take a tour. This depot is absolutely phenomenal. I've had so much fun today. Now what do we have here? Well, this is just a part of the living history that we uh, provide. And of course, um, it's also interesting to know that the exhibits change from time to time. We've added things since the museum opened. So we have people who come through who say, oh, I was already here a year ago. But we've added things and it's constantly changing. These pieces, this is one of the phonographs that was built in 1901. It's not the first phonograph, but it is one of the earlier models. And then these two video exhibits are, are very important. Um, um, it helps us provide a nice marriage between today's technology and the history that we want to bring alive uh, for people in the, who visit here. This piece is a genealogy uh, of the Edison family, and it provides people with the opportunity to come in. You can put your name and your own last name in and see if you might be related to Edison as well. Now, the only thing that I get from him monthly is not a check, it's a bill, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it still helps keep the whole system operating. And this, this piece over here, this video, is uh, what we refer to as life without Edison. It shows uh, a average living room in America today and as you travel through the living room and click on each item when you're finished with the exhibit there's nothing left in the room but the sofa and a couple of pictures on the wall he's touched our life in so many different ways and it also is a way for us to provide information about the number of patents that he uh, obtained in his lifetime he applied for a thousand and ninety three that were granted during his lifetime and then he had four more that were granted after his death I know I was just amazed at all of the inventions that he made. I can't believe it. This is just phenomenal. The man was phenomenal. Well, we think so too. In fact, one of the um, interesting parts of that particular exhibit is that it features the fact that he uh, had 41 patents that uh, were related to the production of concrete alone. He was the uh, founder of poured the, the poured concrete concept and his uh, company, the um, Portland Cement Company, provided 180,000 bags of cement for the uh, building of the New York Yankee, Yankee Stadium. Now, I believe I read that he, in one of the inventions, he had 10,000 failures and then finally he was able to create the invention. It just marvelous. He often said that his greatest failures often ended up being his most wonderful successes because he would always um, maybe later on in life think about something and he would read something in the newspaper or hear something about somebody else's inventions or somebody else's ideas and it would 
cue his memory about things that he had often thought of and he'd go back into his journals. He was an extensive journal keeper. In fact, that began when he was here as a 12 year old boy. Many of his experiments that he started here or his theories, he kept written down. So he always had volumes and volumes of of um, books are intact, notes that he took about um, his ideas and his theories. And they still exist today, so. And also, you have a new exhibit on its way? Yes, we do. It's a baggage car that is circa around 1882, and it will include the portable, uh, portable laboratory, like he would have worked out of, a printing press, not unlike the one he would have produced, the Herald, and also uh, our museum shop, and a reproduction of what uh, smoking area that would have been on the car. It was a combination car, combination baggage car slash smoking car. Oh, that's really exciting, Joe. I know everyone's looking forward to that. I am really impressed with the museum. I'm really impressed with the work that you and your volunteers have done here. And I hope that everyone has a chance to visit TED, the Thomas Edison Depot Museum, and look at the exhibits and learn about Thomas Edison's life and inventions.